Welcome to the Science for the Public lecture series. Science for the Public is an organization committed to bringing science information and issues to the general public. Visit our website for our program listings and blog. Hello, I'm Yvonne Stapp for Science for the Public, and I welcome you to today's presentation by Justin Hollander. Justin Hollander is an assistant professor of urban and environmental policy and planning at Tufts University, and he's a member of the American Institute of Certified Planners. Dr. Hollander received his PhD from Rutgers University and since then has been extensively engaged in land use and environmental planning at the local, regional, and federal levels. He served recently as a Presidential Management Fellow uh, for the U.S. General Services Administration. In his research, Professor Hollander has in, uh, focused on the role of planning uh, and public policy in uh, managing urban land use and environmental issues, especially as associated with abandoned urban neighborhoods. Today, Dr. Hollander will discuss brownfields, the term for land use that's been abandoned because of industrial and other forms of contamination. He's written extensively on brownfields and related uh, land use issues, not only in his scholarly articles, but also in three books for a more general public. Dr. Hollander explains the sources of land damage and how the resulting brownfields have impacted community population and development over the last several decades. For example, right here in Massachusetts. He also brings an optimistic message about how community action can lead to the restoration of brownfield areas, often so often abandoned as hopeless. That message is vitally important to community leaders and citizens today. And we certainly welcome Dr. Justin Hollander. Hello, uh, it's uh, wonderful to, to be here as part of this program. Uh, today I'm going to have a chance to talk to you about some of the research that I've been involved in over the last several years. Um, for uh, most of my career, actually, I've really been interested in a, a topic, what we call it brownfields, and I'll, I'll spend some time explaining what, what I mean by a, by a brownfield. Um, so really, I have about 45 minutes where I'm going to just talk about some of these projects that I've been involved in and some of the kind of the big ideas, some of the issues that I think that is, it's um, important that people kind of are aware of in terms of the um, opportunities that are available for ordinary citizens and the public to be involved in some of the science and uh, policy issues related to contamination, pollution in our uh, built up areas in our cities in our towns. So I have um, three parts of today's lecture. The first part is where I'm going to talk about what is a brownfield? I'm going to give you some definitions and I'm going to talk about some principles. This is a research project that I undertook over the course of several years with a couple of colleagues where we came up with some big ideas about what is, what is a brownfield? What are some principles that we need to be attentive to? And the second topic that I'll be talking about, which is very much related to that, is a research project that I conducted over the course of three years where I explored in depth some of the policy issues surrounding the worst of the worst contaminated properties. What can we do about some of the most seriously contaminated land and buildings in our country? And the last component of, of the lecture is I'm going to talk about the public side of it. What, what can people do to be involved in the reuse and redevelopment of contaminated properties. What can we do, what can you or as ordinary citizens do as part of a public process to address the, the, the contamination and, and abandonment issues 
that brownfields are really all about. So those are the three parts. Um, I'm going to start by just showing you the cover of a, of a book that I published. This is uh, written with uh, Julia Gold, who is a former student of mine at Tufts University, and Neil Kirkwood, who is a professor of landscape architecture at Harvard University in the Graduate School of Design. And the three of us wrote this book as a way to introduce to a non-technical um, audience what some of the issues surrounding the, this problem of brownfields are. So let's start with a, a definition. This is according to the United States Environmental Protection Agency. A brownfield is idle, real property, the development or improvement of which is impaired by real or perceived contamination. So I can guarantee anyone who's watching this program has seen a brownfield, knows brownfields. So this can be as simple as a gas station in your neighborhood that was closed and because of lingering contamination issues, maybe there's an under underground tank that spilled oil into the ground, it's not being reused. So it's just sitting idle. Uh, maybe it's a factory near where you live where there used to be major industrial activity, but it closed and now nobody wants to touch it with a 10-foot pole. There's something wrong on the site. And the big important idea with the EPA's definition is that it could be a matter of a perceived contamination. We, we call it a brownfield, even if we don't know for sure what the problem is. But because of the perception of contamination, it's not being reused. And more importantly, it's not being cared for. So we think about that gas station just around the corner from where you might live. Maybe it's not a big deal that it's hard for that, um, for some, you know, nobody wants to come in and, and reuse that gas station. But what if nobody's taking care of the property? What if there are some public health and environmental problems stemming from that site? So, so brownfields can be a, a serious public problem if, we're not, if they're not being reused, if there's, nobody's taking care of them, nobody's protecting them, nobody's maintaining the property, cutting the grass, uh, uh, take, take, making sure the fences are in place. So, so this is a, a, an issue that has gained a lot of interest over the last couple decades. And um, really, the, what I'm going to talk about here is, um, is a little bit of context to kind of give you a sense of why, why brownfields emerged as a problem. So back, way back in the 1980s, in response to really the growth of environment, environmental movement in the 1970s and uh, a, a lot of public health environmental disasters, Love Canal being the most famous, what happened was there was a, a growth of, of a series of environmental laws and regulations that said, if you contaminate property, if you spill oil or gasoline or throw metals into the land, then you have to clean it up. And so this was a big deal. <laughs> and I think most environmentalists kind of recognize that, that this was an important and, and, and a morally just action by the federal government. And state governments actually followed as well in many cases to kind of put their own little environmental uh, laws in place to, to deal with the, the problems of environmental contamina contamination. Um, CERCLA was a, is an act, C-E-R-C-L-A. Um, CERCLA was an act that was really kind of the, the central uh, driving force behind the enforcement of, of these environmental laws. So the problem is that it made it really difficult for owners of commercial industrial property to sell their property when they didn't need it anymore. So if you uh, ran a Cracker Jack factory and you decide to close the factory for one reason or another, it, it became practically impossible to sell your factory. You, you, you couldn't get anyone to buy it because they were afraid of what kind of solvents you might have used or what kind of oils you might have used in the manufacturing process. And so because of the perception that there might be a problem at the site, it Put a fro a, uh, it froze transactions. It, 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 put a, it was a freezing effect 
um, on the normal real estate market. So EPA responded in the 1990s with funding and technical support. They gave out uh, millions of dollars in grants and provided a lot of assistance, one-on-one -on -one assistance. They even put federal employees in city halls across the country and said, you know what, this is a problem. And we're not going to, you know, it's, it's okay that um, it's hard to redevelop. We're going to be there to help you. We're going to hold your hand. And then actually eventually even some um, minor amendments were made to that act, CERCLA. So right now we're in a position where the EPA is behind this effort to try to get these sites into reuse. Nobody's saying we should get rid of all those environmental laws. It's really the movement now is, okay, these environmental laws are in place. How can we make sure that these sites don't just stay there, stagnant, stagnant, polluting, dangerous? So there's been some movement. So I have a slide that, I, that you see up there, um, which I want to just make these three important points about why it, it matters. Why do we want to clean these sites up? Why is this so important? So in, in the, uh, the top slide, what you see is an image of, uh, well, this is a brownfield, right? So this is just a sketch of what a property might look like. You know, maybe it had been used for 100 years as a, some sort of industrial manufacturing facility, but the owners were not operators were not always that careful about taking the necessary steps to protect the soil and the groundwater. And so maybe they were a little reckless. Well, so what we're talking about here is it's important to get this site into some sort of reuse because of this first point on the left side, which is brown versus green fields. So I define for you brown fields. Well, a green field is the, I, this, this concept that outside of built up urban, urbanized, suburbanized areas, we have forest areas, meadows, wetlands, we have farms, and these are what we call green fields because it's really the opposite of the brown field. It's a place where a firm may end up coming in and building something. And this is a process that um, ends up creating a, a sprawling metropolitan development pattern. So we, as planners, we try to find ways to encourage investment in existing urban areas. So eliminate the development on these green fields. So focus new stuff, new activity on these brown fields. So, so, then, so you see the um, investment in um, cleaning up and reusing the site on the bottom. Um, you know, illustrates how there can be real value in creating uh, positive amenities and assets right in existing urbanized areas as opposed to uh, building out in the, in the fringe, in rural areas, or building on farms. The second point uh, I want to emphasize in terms of why it matters is this idea of the contagion effect. If you, if you leave a site like this for a long time, it becomes a problem for the surrounding neighborhood. And it can eventually be a problem for citywide. It, it, there is a documented um, economic drag on neighboring property values for these kinds of brownfields. And so to the extent that we just say it doesn't matter, you know, the site is contaminated, but we can't do anything about it, we're contributing to a, a spreading, a contagion effect throughout the area. And so this can happen because people see that a property is not being taken care of, so they're not as willing to invest across the street or one block down. There's concerns about, well, what kind of contamination might there be on this, this mill site that, that is in the upper frame of the slide? Well, not really knowing. Maybe people aren't going to invest. They're not going to put the additions on their homes. They're not going to do the renovations. Um, so. The contagion effect is a really important one. And the last point I'm going to actually spend a little bit of time talking about in a few minutes, which is the worst of the worst. Um, some of these properties aren't just contagion, aren't just a problem, don't just have um, uh, public health issues, but they actually can really transform neighborhoods in a, in a negative way. Um, so I'm going to spend a, a few minutes talking about that a little bit later. So let's just talk a little bit about the scope of the problem. Half a million brownfields are estimated to be in the USA. Um, every region uh, across the country and internationally, we have brownfields, um, and not just in urban areas, in suburban and rural areas. 
Um, and there have been billions of, billions of dollars have been spent um, through federal, federal funding, through state, through private funding. And ultimately, we're only getting started because there's still so much work to be done. So the aims of this book, The Principles of Brownfield's Regeneration, that I showed you the cover before, is to start, is to really to learn from these first timers. Um, learn from people who just, for the first time, got a chance to work on, on redeveloping and reusing a, a brownfield site. And so the, um, the research involved interviews with these first time brownfields reusers. And, um, and then what we did is we developed key principles that, uh, that drew from both those interviews and through our, our experience, the author's experience, and through our review of the literature. Um, and then what we did was we showed how those principles applied in five key studies. Um, so just uh, quickly, I'm going to go through a couple of these principles. Um, the first is that it's really critical for anyone kind of getting involved in a brownfield site is to get a plan together. You've got to identify who's going to be involved. There are a lot of po potential stakeholders. What kind of engineers, what kind of scientists, what kind of lawyers do you need to be involved? Communications is a really critical part of that plan. Um, how are you going to get the word out? This, this issue of contamination, it's not just the real contamination, it's the perceived contamination. So how, how are you going to talk about that in going through a process of addressing a site? And then finding out what kind of funding or support is available right in the beginning. And that's really an important part of the, uh, the first principle. The second pr principle is that it's really, throughout the whole reuse of a, a brownfield process, it's critical to assess organize and implement a remediation strategy. Um, there's a lot of examples of where this has been done piecemeal. So we're ta I'm talking here about approaching it in a systematic way, considering state and federal authorities, and doing the necessary outreach um, to butters, community leaders, citizens throughout a community about those environmental challenges. And the third principle is to put land use and design considerations at the fore. Um, the, it, Brownfields reuse is about remaking a place more than anything else. It's about elevating infrastructure and amenities. It's about making a positive contribution. There's a, there are ways, we know ways to make soil, storm, water drainage, and vegetation decisions that are going to actually enhance the quality of life for the people who experience this place. And so we want to invest in, in that in, as part of the third principle. So what I'd like to do in, uh, in just the next couple of minutes is use, use this time to, to talk about one case study that came from the book and how those, those three principles apply. Um, so this is what we call the Asenpin Greenway in Trenton, New Jersey. It is a stretch of about 100 acres um, in Trenton, which is the capital of the state, um, along the Asenpin Creek. And so for this, these 100 acres, you can see it's a primarily a desolate, <laughs> derelict space. There are a couple, just a handful of industrial activities still ongoing. Most of them um, are, are closed, uh, abandoned. Some have been demolished. Um, and so this is an area that has um, experienced a lot of, of industrial decline. And um, a lot of it actually was due to a major flood that occurred about, uh, about 15, 20 years ago. Um, so 15 brownfields throughout this, this creek corridor. Um, and what happened was after this big flood, the uh, Federal Emergency Management Agency recommended that the area be converted into a greenway. So when we think about a contaminated property, we think about a brownfield uh, turned into a greenway? I mean, what does that even mean? I mean, it was, it's, it's this idea that, we, that maybe it should just be a park. You know, maybe this is not really the best place to have manufacturing and industrial activities. So the, so the first principle in action was with the help from the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, the city of Trenton hired a, a full-time brownfield specialist, and they, came, they put a plan right together. Um, they did extensive outreach and what they called in-reach, you know, in terms of getting consensus both within the city and all the players and the neighbors and the property owners to, to create a vision for the Greenway. 
So principle number two is really about the remediation strategy. So in 2000, they reached that consensus and they reached out to all of the potential funding sources, state, federal, county, and they were able to get, the, get funding started. They, they haven't, it hasn't been a one-shot deal. It's been over the course of many steps and stages. And right now, they're roughly halfway through doing the project. Um, they, they, and, and it was last year that they started with some of the demolition and remediation. It's really a long-term vision for how these brownfield properties can get into place. So the third principle is really to, to put those land use and design considerations at the fore. Uh, it was Frederick Law Olmsted Jr., one of the great thinkers and leaders in la landscape architecture and planning, who came up with a greenway plan for the city of Trenton that, that identified the Assenpink Creek as, as a centerpiece. So this was over 100 years ago that this plan was put in place. And so it was really looked to as inspiration for, for the current project. Um, and as, as uh, the Federal Emergency Management Agency uh, suggested that this is a, a, an environmental uh, hazard because of the, 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 this, um, the flooding problem. So in, in fact, the creek, this, this vision for a, a greenway can ma manage extreme water weather events. It, it can mitigate the, uh, the problems associated with with excessive water in the area. So really, it, it works on a lot of levels. Um, and so it's a kind of a good example of, of how these three principles were kind of put in place for a success story. And so just a, a couple of other thoughts on, that, on, on what we talked about in the book. Um, so one size does not fit all, you know, when you're looking at brownfields. There, the f purpose of including five case studies in this book was that, that each one tells a very unique story, and, and, each, and each brownfield is unique. Um, but something that we learned in doing the research was that, that first-timers provided a really interesting, unique perspective. They were able to help us understand um, the challenges that, that are faced by, by other um, uh, Brownfields redevelopers through, um, through the fact that we all, me and my co-authors, had experience, and here they were facing it for the first time. And my last uh, uh, kind of thought I wanted to share about you know, thinking about that, that project was that regeneration of a brownfield does not have to mean development. And I talk about uh, this idea of smart shrinkage in uh, my, uh, my, my latest book, Sunburnt Cities, where I looked at some of the challenges faced by uh, cities in the Sun Belt as they faced uh, decline and shrinkage related to the Great Recession and the foreclosure crisis. Um, so rethinking, what does it even mean to be successful in a brownfield? Maybe you don't actually have to build a new factory or a mall or housing on it. Just letting it return back to nature, that, that, might, be, that might be smart shrinkage. So, so that's, a, a, that's the principles of Brownfields Regeneration Project. Um, so what I want to now turn to in my, my second project I wanted to, to share some thoughts about are, is related to the worst of the worst brownfields. And so now that you have kind of a sense of introduction to the, the, the concept of brownfield, well, what I want to talk about now is the challenge of some of these sites. And this picture illustrates this is a former steel mill in Youngstown, Ohio. I mean, some of these sites are just so big and so contaminated. <laughs> like, it, we're not talking about the corner gas station anymore. What do you do with these worst of the worst brownfields? And so what I did was I spent several years and I did a research project where I asked that question and I um, wanted to just kind of talk about, talk about that project here. Um, so let's start off by looking at uh, some images here of the, this is the Delco Appliance Factory in Rochester, New York. And this was a factory that had been in operation for, I think it was almost 100 years. Um, but then they stopped making appliances in Rochester. I mean, they stopped doing a lot of things in Rochester. Uh, it's one of what we call the uh, post-industrial city. It's a, a city that has lost vast amounts of, of manufacturing. And so, so what do you do with these giant hulking sites? And this one has actually, they, they had funding to partially demolish it, but not fully. And so what you see here is just, it's just so big and, and hulking and, and, and 
what kinds of potential contamination could, could exist here? I mean, there's cars. I mean, people literally have just abandoned cars at the site. And, there, and there's uh, trees growing here. And so the question is, what do you do about a site like this? And so um, I want to start off by just kind of showing that this is Rochester. And if you look here where the arrow is pointing, I'm pointing the star. This is where the Delco Appliance Factory uh, is located. And what I drew here was a quarter mile uh, radius around the, the factory. So there's been some interesting research that has demonstrated that there is a measurable decline in property values more than a quarter mile away from these kinds of large, worst of the worst properties. So what is City Hall doing? And City Hall is right down the road there. What are they doing about it? And that's, that's really what the point of this project was, to understand how are local governments, cities responding. So I use a, an idea that came from the literature. Michael Greenberg at Rutgers University has written about this extensively. He calls them high toads high impact, temporarily obsolete, abandoned derelict sites, unutilized, abandoned real property, which has a measurable impact on property values more than a quarter mile away. I mean, these are serious problems for neighborhoods. And so the question is, well, first of all, where in America are we going to find these high toads among large US cities, which are likely to have neighborhoods with, with sites like that Delco site, these high toads? And the second question was, do local officials and planners recognize them as a problem? I'm, t I'm saying they're a problem, but what about local officials? And then the third question is, what, what policies do they use to address them? Are they doing anything about them? And then how successful are they? So I'm going to just run through this with you just to kind of give you a sense of this project. This, um, this whole research project was written up in the book that's actually uh, sitting next to me. And, um, We'll I'll talk about that in a, in a little bit. So the first uh, idea was to understand where are these cities. And so I created a, an index using some statistical software, um, considering a lot of different variables, like um, how much manufacturing was lost in the area, um, what kind of uh, income levels are in the area, what kind of um, uh, environmental problems are, are known to exist in that area. And then I did phone interviews with uh, officials in 21 of those cities that ranked high on that index. And then I followed up with case studies, and that involved site visits where I traveled and took pictures and met folks in, in uh, five of those cities, New Bedford, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Richmond, Virginia, Trenton, and Youngstown, Ohio. So what did I find? Well, first of all, as you might not be too surprised, the Northeast and the Midwest had the vast majority of these high toad sites, these Delco type sites. On average, they had nine in their communities. And, uh, and then they also had two which were redeveloped um, over the last decade. And the second question was, well, is it a problem? Do they recognize it as a problem? And, and overwhelmingly, yes. Uh, there were definitely a, f a few uh, local officials I talked to that were not as enthusiastic. But for the most part, they saw that, that these sites were dragging down their neighborhoods and dragging down their cities, and they saw that was, that was a problem. So what did they do about them? And that's really the third question. What did these cities do about them? Well, there's what we call economic development. It's just conventional, like let's uh, provide incentives for companies to move into the area uh, to take over the site. Uh, let's uh, knock down the building so it makes it more attractive to a potential company to come in. We'll provide grants and lo low interest loans. That's economic development. The other, the other approach was interesting, community empowerment. This was something that was very common that uh, quite a few cities, they provided the necessary political infrastructure to empower neighborhood groups, uh, resident associations, nonprofit organizations that are active in the community, empower them to bring problems to the attention of the local leaders. And as you can imagine, if you had a high toad a Delco appliance factory in your neighborhood, you'd bring that to the attention of your local leaders. And, and in many cases, that really worked. And then that uh, provided an impetus for the city to, to go out and, and address those sites. 
And the last was really part of something uh, I call the healthy environment approach, where local leaders saw that the environmental movement was picking up steam and the public health movement was really active and maybe we can make ourselves look good by investing in uh, cleaning up contaminated property, uh, ameliorating ameliorating, uh, public health challenges. And so so this is really what cities did. Um, But unfortunately, the answer to the last question was that they weren't really that successful. The efforts largely failed. Um, more than half of the high toads that were included in the study, that were identified through my research, weren't even being addressed by the local government. They weren't even doing anything to address these, these kinds of properties. So uh, as a way to just kind of put a little bit of um, a texture on this story, I want to talk about, uh, briefly about one case study. This, was, um, this is the city of New Bedford, which is in the uh, southeastern Massachusetts. And um, what I have here are um, this uh, little rectangle here is City Hall. And then you see the red dots are the high toads that were identified in the study. So the Morse Cutting Tools site was an um, active factory that was right in the middle of this residential neighborhood. It used to exist on this grassy spot right here, as you can see, surrounded by homes. Actually, quite a large residential community, probably like 200 homes within a quarter mile of the site. But smack dab in the middle of this neighborhood was a cutting tools factory. And so what does that mean? They made knives. (laughs) They made knives and all various kinds of cutting tools. This was a problem because of the kind of lubricating oils that are used in the manufacture of cutting tools. And the fact was that the the company that that operated the Morris site was not that careful. And they poured quite a bit, or at least quite a bit of, um, of, of lubricating oil leaked into the soil. Um, and so uh, here's another example of the Elko Dress Factory. Uh, this, again, you can see cheek to jowl with a residential neighborhood. This is, these are two um, homes, and, it's, and that dress factory is right behind. Now, in the manufacturing of dresses, you don't have lubricating oils and, and some of the, the harmful carcinogenic problems associated with, with those. But you do have other issues. You have asbestos. You have lead-based paint. Um, you have dyes. And so... This factory stayed, um, after the the dress factory was closed, decades, it stayed um, just sitting like that in the neighborhood without being properly cared for or maintained. Eventually it got into city ownership because the the owners failed to pay taxes. So uh, this is a a big problem for the neighborhood. And really here the issue is more than anything else about perceived contamination. What is inside there? Like not really knowing for sure. Uh, some preliminary investigations were done, and um, the you know not much was found. But the neighborhood neighbors were worried. So, so they what happened was that the local uh, resident associations really fought the city and and demanded that the city use their resources to, to finish uh, doing the necessary environmental work and then demolish the building. And it worked. So the New Bedford, city of New Bedford had the appropriate community empowerment policies in place so that that was possible and, and, and local, local action really worked. Um, the last site I want to talk about in New Bedford is, the, is Pierce Mills. Uh, again, it was a mill site, various industrial activity for over 100 years. And when that site came down, uh, local leaders in the neighborhood uh, again, through community empowerment policies, we're able to fight for and get a park built at that location. Now, the funding, interestingly, for this park came from the fact that there was a major lawsuit that resulted in a, a fund being created in the harbor. And it's a little hard to see, but I'll just try to point out to you. Uh, off in the distance behind this, this um, um, park, is uh, water, and that's the uh, New Bedford Harbor. And, and in the, the lawsuit, the, the, this fund was created that actually set aside money for projects just like this. Um, so kind of a success story. 
So, so um, the New Bedford story is one where, um, and it's, it's the, New Bedford is a shrinking city, has lost uh, vast amounts of industrial activity and population over the last uh, roughly 70 or 80 years. And you would think, I thought, there would be more of these high toads. But, but what we call bottom feeders, these uh, kind of low-end companies, um, scrap metal, tire collecting, um, these kinds of companies moved into what would have been a high toad and have kept a lot, quite a few of these old mills uh, occupied. And, and, and I think that's really important that, that a lot of city officials don't like that. In, in my interviews, my research, I found that for the most part, they don't like bottom feeders. They want high end. They want like a software company or a biotech. They, they don't want these kinds of low end industrial uh, economic uses. But it's important to recognize that the, the, those exact uses are what keep those buildings occupied. So vandals don't get in, fires don't happen. Uh, we don't have the kind of public health problems that are associated with, when, when a building isn't cared for. Um, so federal support was really uh, catalytic with uh, Brownfield's reuse in, in New Bedford. This is an example of where uh, an actual federal employee from the National Oceanic, Oceanic an atmospheric association, NOAA uh, agency, sorry, um, came to New Bedford and worked in City Hall. And his ability to coordinate federal grants and federal loans and support was, was really catalytic and allowed um, a lot of the, the kind of positive reuse stuff and some of the stories I mentioned to make them happen. So another part of the story, which I, I just want to make uh, just these two final points, that, that, that there was a slotting process that occurred very early on in New Bedford's uh, planning for brownfields. Uh, what they did was they, uh, the mayor gathered together a lot of city, uh, city leaders and they talked about how can we get new uses for a bunch of brownfields. This was a process that lacked, lacked any real public participation and it's interesting because it failed because the, the, the slotting process that, that the mayor uh, organized resulted in just a lot of anger and people were, were you know, refused to accept the, the ways that these, these properties were slotted. So, so really the examples I, I highlighted before about neighborhoods gather, um, getting together, working with nonprofit organizations, fighting for um, uh, environmental work and dem demolition, that is what is so much a part, part of this, this success of, of New Bedford's high toads and brownfields. My last point here is that, that New Bedford really tried to position itself um, th to be a brownfields capital. They wanted to be a place where other cities and towns could learn about, well, how do you do this brownfields thing? And so it was really interesting, and it, it continues to be a big part of the, the story of New Bedford, trying to capitalize on what might be seen as a weakness, the fact that there are so many older industrial properties that aren't being used. Um, but so that's an interesting question. It's a, I put a question mark at the end of that, that point. Is it a Brownfields capital? Is that really, really going to work? Okay, so my, the last segment I wanted to talk about is um, really how do we think about engaging the public in a systematic way? The stories I told about um, in New Bedford, about um, community engagement, was, were really stories about... Um, of the fighting of two sides, very kind of antagonistic. What we're not seeing a lot in the Brownfields world is a role for ordinary citizens to have voice without it being and so antagonistic. Um, so what, I, what, I, what you see here is um, a virtual model that I created with a, a team of my colleagues and students at Tufts University. This is a model of a neighborhood in the town of Acton Massachusetts. So what we're thinking about here is how can the role of the public change as we look at brownfields or any kind of urban planning, how cities change, managing change, thinking about what the role of science and, and, and technical knowledge is, how do we bring the role, how do we bring the public into that conversation? And so I've launched something um, that I call the Open Neighborhood Project. And you can actually look at that online. I'll show you the, the, the link at the end of the presentation. And the Open Neighborhood Project begins to kind of challenge some of the assumptions that we've used in the past. So I just want to uh, give you a quick um, outline of, of how I'm going to you know, talk about this.
So we have to begin in, in thinking about the role of the public. We need to define the public. So I'm going to you know, spend a minute talking about that. Uh, Sherry Arnstein, very famous uh, thinker in, in, the, in the, the, the field of development and, and redevelopment and planning, she came up with a ladder of citizen participation rules, so we'll talk about that. We'll talk about um, what are the current practices for engaging citizens? What are the ways that, that we connect uh, the people and redevelopment or, or abandoned properties? And then we'll talk about alternative modes and models. Defining the public. Wow, this is, um, this is how we've done in the past. And if you look at that image I have behind me, there's a table. And at the, on the table are all the officials, all the important people. And then there's the audience. All these people, all these people are here. And this is, the pub, this is the public. They're the ones in the audience. So I'm actually not really so happy with this, this conception. Sherry Arnstein offered us an alternative way to think about the public. That the public is, the, is really a, a, a way for us to engage the government in citizen participation, in, in a conversation. So if you go down to the bottom of her ladder, there's manipulation. And this is a, a category where she's basically saying it's not even participation. They're just standing in the front of the room. They're not even listening to the fact that there's 100 people, that there's 100 people um, in, in the audience complaining. So that's non-participation. And then therapy, where they're just, the government officials are just telling everyone, oh, everything's going to be OK. So as we go up the ladder, we see something that she refers to as tokenism, where really the, 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 the kind of involvement of ordinary people is really almost a joke. Yes, people are talking. It's, you know, it, it's not like they're not, there's no participation at all, but is this really, is this really gonna um, uh, be meaningful? And Sherry Arnstein invites us to consider at the top of the ladder, citizen power, where there's genuine partnerships, where power is being delegated to people and then ultimately to citizen control. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I uh, advanced the slide too quickly. Um, so the way that the public is engaged right now is through the following, those uh, five items I have listed up above. Now, the public hearing is what I showed before in that, that slide. Is that, um, is that really the best? In some cases, that's all we have. Um, workshops can be much more interactive. They can have a lot better um, outcomes. Um, they can be, certainly be more interactive. Computer-assisted workshops provides a way for people to be involved in the issues of, their, of public policy and planning and redevelopment without necessarily having to come to a meeting on a Tuesday at 7 p.m. You know, they, maybe they could log on from their computer through a, a workshop. Citizen committees is actually a, a, a third, a fourth, the fourth item I, I have here. And here, the idea is that citizens work together to formulate ideas, to workshop ideas, and then bring those directly to local leaders. And the last idea is, that's used in practice currently is office hours. And virtually every uh, state or federal Politician has office hours where um, you know, the, 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 the politician, the leader, gets to, gets to hear from regular people just by them kind of stopping by. So each one of these has its, its pluses and, and negatives. So let's, let's talk about alternative models. Well, so you know, we, I asked the question of who is the public, but you know, it's really critical that, that the people involved be delineated because it was kind of a rhetorical, que rhetorical question. There really, I mean, there's no real definition of who the public is. The public can be so many different things to so many different people. But when you're actually designing a public process, you need to delineate that. You need to say the public comprises of the people who live next door to this brownfield, the people who live 
within a quarter mile of the brownfield. The local environmental organizations that are active in cleanup and remediation. Lawyers who work in this area. I mean, you have to define it. And oftentimes in current practices, we don't do a good job of that and we don't define it. And whoever is involved is whoever shows up. So, so that's an important question. How the agenda is set, of course, is critical. And I gave a couple examples of current practices. Well, office hours can be positive, you know, a politician and a citizen talking. There can be an interesting dialogue. The, uh, the computer-based involvement can be positive. So each one of these has strengths and weaknesses. So to define how exactly that engagement is going to happen and to not let it simply be a matter of we're going to stand on a stage and talk to you and you're going to listen. To think about Sherry Arnstein's ladder and to think about how can we, can we make sure that that engagement moves up the ladder. And, and that connects to this idea of dialogue. What is the nature of the discussion? How do we talk to each other? Are the public officials, when they're talking about contamination, are they speaking in a way that people understand? Are they using language or scientific terms that people don't understand? Well, then that's not going to be true dialogue, and that's what we're aiming for. And then, of course, what results from the engagement? Are we talking about a conversation, meetings, notes are made, and then it's put off on a shelf? No, I think that, that that's a critical question. So make sure that that engagement moves ahead. So here are three kind of big ideas. The first is tapping local knowledge. And those of you who are familiar with some of the kind of really new, interesting uh, kind of theory about this, is it's that ordinary citizens know so much more than, than planners or government officials or their, or their consultants. They know so much more about the places that they live in. So this idea of citizen science, that, that we want to tap this local knowledge, we want to understand how do people in their experiences understand the problems, whether it's uh, the problems of contamination, uh, the problems of redevelopment. Whatever the problems are, we need to find ways to understand better, as planners, we need to understand better what ordinary people think. And as ordinary people, as citizens, you need to find ways to plug your, your knowledge back into the political process. And the second um, uh, point here on my slide is that residents involved in a planning process need to uh, design, implement, and evaluate the results of these outreach and investigations. And so related to citizen science, this idea of community science, and so it's not enough for us to just say, well, the government's going to do it. They, they're the experts, so they're that, that official is an engineer, so we have to respect that. We need to be more involved in conversations and dialogues between citizens and the, these uh, elect, elected officials or appointed officials, um, and that, that, that can result in a meaningful process from start to finish where residents design, implement, and evaluate those results. The last point here is games and fun. And make it web-based. Make it mobile web-based. And that's connected to this stuff I've, I'm doing, and I'll, I'll show you a little bit about that now. So we call it Open Neighborhood. This was the first project I was involved in in this area. Um, so I'm using a program here called Second Life, secondlife.com. And you create virtual models, 3D virtual models, of real places. This is uh, one I'm working on now in uh, Gilman Square neighborhood of Somerville. They're going to be getting a new uh, light rail train station in this neighborhood. So it's going to change. This place is going to change. And so we're going through a process. We're helping people in the neighborhood, local leaders, understand through these 3D walkthrough environments how it might change. And so ordinary people can log on to our website walk through these areas, watch videos of, of the areas, see how it might change, and then give feedback. Talk about what they like and they don't like. And then that information can be channeled up to local officials and then back down again, and we can make changes to these models as the political circumstances might de demand. But what's really exciting is that you know, youth get really involved, people get really excited about this stuff. People see that Planning, government work is, is actually really exciting and really important. And it's not always about kind of responding to a crisis situation. 
We found in, in our work that some people are really scared of the computer stuff. So you know, we put out crayons and, and uh, cardboard, glue, post-it notes, and, and give people a chance to express their opinions about uh, their neighborhood or, or redevelopment um, through analog approaches, not just digital, also through these analog approaches. Uh, this was a result of what we did in Acton. Uh, over 50 people came up with a, a redesign for this neighborhood, this Kelly's Corner, um, both uh, using both the virtual and the analog tools. And so it provides a rich uh, tapestry of, of different opinions about what can happen in a place. Uh, oh, this is just the website for the Somerville Project, trying to make um, uh, new avenues to, for, to, for people to communicate uh, their issues, their opinions, their concerns to local government. And this, this project um, in Somerville, we're doing in partnership with a local nonprofit in Somerville, the Somerville Community Corporation. And we're trying to understand um, local opinions and, and issues. And then we're going to kind of push that back up through to, to local government. So here is a, a couple websites. The main one is, is open-neighborhood.org. So I just put there my contact information. I hope you enjoyed hearing about some of the work that I've been doing. I am happy to answer questions if you send me an email or you want to call. I'm definitely interested to hear what some issues that you, you're facing kind of in your home, in your, your community. So thank you so much. So for a long time, I've been working as an urban planner in a variety of different um, communities, cities and towns, and just really interested in some of the challenges that cities and towns face when they experience changes. And, and for a long time, the kind of changes I was really interested in was uh, when they grew. And I started actually my career in central Massachusetts when places were growing, a lot, of, a lot of new houses, farms were being eaten up by subdivisions. And what happened was I went through a little bit of transition. I began to see that while the problem of growth is an important one, that not, not a lot of people were paying attention to the problem of decline and disinvestment. And I began to notice that, that when factories were closed, there wasn't the same kind of energy and enthusiasm to deal with them. There wasn't the attention to lasting environmental contamination and, and, and devastation that was left behind when a military base closed or a, a supply depot closed. So I began to be interested in that and I got a chance to work with the federal government and the public building service which is uh, part of the United States General Services Administration and, and got to be involved in, in base closure, military base closure, and, and got to be part of finding new uses and, and dealing with, with environmental contamination on those kinds of properties. Yeah, so some of the stuff that I teach in my courses at Tufts um, can be very complex, can be multifaceted, and I feel like the best way for them to learn is to get out into the field, to meet with community partners, with local leaders to visit sites and to get a hands-on experience where they can actually be involved in reusing, revisioning contaminated, abandoned properties. So, I mean, the most gratifying part of my work is when I get to be involved in addressing real problems that real citizens face and um, to kind of step down from the ivory tower a little bit and to be able to affect positive change, especially dealing with disadvantaged communities. A lot of places that I've worked in my experience, uh, people don't necessarily feel like they're empowered. And so to be able to apply some of my background experiences to be able to help them address some of their, their problems in their community. Um, some, of the, some of those challenging part of my work is very much tied to that, which is that it, it can be very hard. There are some really serious entrenched forces that, uh, for one thing, try to repress dissent, try to um, restrict the voices of the disempowered. And so that can be very frustrating to kind of face that head on and, and to have to explain to my students that that's, uh, that's really how the world works. And uh, you know, we believe where I, where I work in, in um, preparing students to be practical visionaries. 
you know, we want them to be able to see the future, to see possibilities, but we, we want them to understand that there are some real limitations and, and we try to teach them how to be practical about it. So the, the challenges that we face as a society cannot be addressed by a bunch of academics and, and our students. This is a problem that we need to engage and energize ordinary people. And we expect, we expect problems will be solved on their own, and they, they don't. And so it's, it's really critical that, that people understand the places they live, they understand whether it's environmental contamination or pollution in their neighborhood, and that they work to, to, to study those facts and that they learn those facts and that they can be in a position to apply those facts in the policy process and to be part of being an agent of change.